Hello. Since Star Trek first aired in 1966, fans have longed to board the Federation Starship Enterprise, go on a mission, and recalibrate the deflector dish. But it wouldn't be until 1978 that they could do so officially, when the first Star Trek role-playing game was released. But it wouldn't be the only one. Oh no. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today we're boldly going to explore the history of Star Trek role-playing. I've been a Star Trek fan as long as I can remember, and my Star Trek viewing of choice has normally been Deep Space Nine. But to me, the Star Trek universe is so much more than just one show. It is a whole place full of different stories. It's almost a feeling. I love to read and watch and tell stories in that universe, and what better way to interact with it than through a role-playing game. If you enjoyed today's video, please leave a like, or if you really enjoy it, feel free to leave a super thanks too. Over the years, there have been four Star Trek role-playing game lines. No, wait, there have been five. There are five lines. Wait, there's actually been way more than that, depending on how you want to count them. So let's get started. Okay, so number one. The first role-playing game set in the Star Trek universe was released by Heritage Models in 1978. Heritage Models Inc. was one of the biggest wargaming manufacturers in the US through the 70s. Although they initially focused on historicals, they went on to become an early proponent of licensed miniatures casting, producing ranges based on Robert E. Howard's Conan the Barbarian, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, and Edgar Rice Burroughs' John Carter Warlord of Mars. Heritage released a range of 25mm Star Trek miniatures that included many of the Enterprise bridge crew, as well as a host of Klingons, Romulans, Tellarites, and many more aliens from the original series. They even made two promotional miniatures at 75mm scale, Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Spock, to help sell the range. Though I love the idea of an away team encountering some alien technology that just kind of king-sizes Kirk, and he's about 18 foot for the rest of the episode. Alongside the miniatures came paints and painting guides, and of course, the role-playing game. The president of Heritage Models, Duke Siegfried, which is an incredible name by the way, was convinced that the role-playing game would help sell the miniatures because it would make it more accessible. People were familiar with these stories and would want to tell stories with them. This first attempt at Star Trek role-playing called Star Trek Adventure Gaming in the Final Frontier and came as a 40-page rulebook provided as a complimentary extra with the miniatures. It was designed by Michael Scott. No, not that one. The game was, of course, based on the 1966 original series, as well as drawing on the wider universe that had been further explored in 1972's Star Trek The Animated Series. It was a relatively simple game of scientific exploration on planetary away team missions, with a little bit of classic Star Trek action thrown in, in case you wanted to wrestle a Romulan or double punch a Gorn. In a surprisingly candid paragraph in the game, it actually makes it clear that you don't require any of the heritage miniatures in order to play the Star Trek Adventure Gaming in the Final Frontier roleplay game, just that they can add an extra touch of realism, somehow, and help indicate where characters are in relation to the environments and enemies. A rare bit of downselling in the RPG business. Whether because of their faultful honesty or not, Heritage Models was in financial difficulty by the end of the 1970s. They hived off their board game operations in an attempt to stay afloat, but it just wasn't enough. And by 1982, the company was bankrupt. The rights to Star Trek role-playing reverted to Paramount, and Star Trek Adventure Gaming in the Final Frontier was buried alive. Starfleet Voyages was the next entry in Star Trek RPG history, and it shared a lot of DNA with its older sibling. This game was also designed by Michael Scott, largely as a revision of his previous rule set. Published in 1982 by Terra Games Company, this game didn't appear to actually hold a license to use the Star Trek name or universe, and was released in direct competition with an official RPG. It didn't end well. Reviews were not positive, on the basis that you could either go back to the Heritage Models version of the game and get most of the content there, or you could get the more comprehensive and more effective official RPG that was being released the same year by FASA Corp. That RPG was Star Trek The Role Playing Game, and it was going to receive extensive support for the next seven years. 
Fasa had been founded two years earlier and initially produced a line of traveller supplements. It was formed by Jordan Weissman and Ross Babcock III, and the name was a Marx Brothers reference, the Freedonian Aeronautics and Space Administration. Weissman was keen for Fasa to grow, and to that end he sought out the biggest sci-fi license he could lay his hands on, Star Trek. Weissman and Babcock looked for a new design team to build a suitable rule set for their new Star Trek title, but it took them a while to find the right individuals. After rejecting four other teams, a freelance group working under the name Fanta Simulations Association provided an acceptable design pitch, and they were engaged by FASA. This team consisted of Guy McLemore Jr., Greg Poline, and David F. T. Paul, a trio who would later contribute to Castle Greyhawk for AD&D. Wiseman and Babcock were worried that the previous submissions had focused too much on the combat and militarization, and that that ran counter to Gene Roddenberry's utopian vision for Star Trek. There was still combat in the Fanta Simulations version of the game, but it ran much more towards collaboration and teamwork, and the game overall was focused on science and exploration. The first edition of the basic game was released as a box set in 1982, and it was based primarily on the original series, but it did incorporate aspects of the first two movies, Star Trek The Motion Picture and Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. First edition supplements for the game covered starship recognition and construction in the Federation and Klingon empires, deck plans, a games master screen, and a source book on trader captains and merchant princes, allowing players to take on the role of independent merchants running the star lanes of the Federation. This supplement and the rest of the first edition was well received and got the game a second edition in 1983, an edition which in the UK was published by Games Workshop. In order to create opportunities for interesting stories, the Trader Captain's book had included a neutral territory between the Federation, Klingons and Romulans that was called the Triangle. The game also expanded on the lore and presence of the Klingons and the Romulans, way beyond what had been seen up to that point in the original series. A source book called The Klingons was written by John M. Ford, an award-winning science fiction author who had developed material for Traveller amongst other games. This Klingon source book, along with a Star Trek novel that Ford wrote from the perspective of the Klingons, depicts a culture that shares some similarities with what we would later see in the official lore, but which differed significantly in individual motivations and behaviours, things like Klingon crews regularly assassinating and plotting their way to the top rank. The Romulans also received a source book, and again, given that it could draw on only a few episodes of the original series, new lore was developed that could fill the gaps in their culture and history. Other new material would cover ships, star dates, languages, and Federation history that just hadn't been expanded on in an official capacity yet. More source books followed, introducing elements from the third and fourth Star Trek movies, Klingon and Romulan ships, operations and military history, and a book all about the Orions. There would also be a whole host of adventure modules, with 20 published between 1983 and 1987. I especially like the sound of the adventure The Dixie Gambit that sees a trio of lost ships in the Triangle that may or may not have been destroyed by the Klingons, but political machinations abound and nothing is quite what it seems. With the start of a new little show called Star Trek The Next Generation in 1987, things for the game began to look a little unsure. In 1988, FASA published the Next Generation Officer's Manual, followed in 1989 by the Next Generation First Year Sourcebook. These supplements attempted to incorporate the new canon that was emerging on TNG regarding the Klingons and the Romulans in particular, with everything that had been published for the game thus far. Unfortunately for the game's designers, there were just too many things that didn't quite mesh. They had been working without the benefit of an official canon for the better part of a decade after all. And Paramount were unhappy with the approach that had been taken in those two TNG supplements. After reviewing the entire Star Trek the role-playing game line, they had decided that the line must be drawn here. <coughs> here. And no further supplements were going to be released. This was the end of the FASA role-playing game. It's still remembered fondly by many fans for having a just amazing support system, loads of supplements, loads of adventures. It was an impressive version of Star Trek, even if it diverged from what Star Trek would become over the subsequent years. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Sukuda Hobby Company 
had started the 80s publishing war game rules under their hobby simulation game sci-fi series that included Star Wars and Gundam titles. Amongst other titles was also 1982's Star Trek The Invasion of the Klingon Empire, a mind-bogglingly complex looking game supporting two to four players, a huge hex map, starship factories and production, war between the Federation, Klingons and Romulans, as well as the intersecting journeys of the Enterprise flitting across the galaxy throughout. A follow-up based on Wrath of Khan was released the next year, mostly simplifying and refining certain gameplay elements. If anyone has read the rules or played these games, I would love to hear from you because they sound fascinating. Sakuda were intent on entering the market and creating a new RPG. This was something that hadn't been seen in Japan before. A pen and paper RPG, or a table talk RPG, TRPG as it became known, which was different from video game RPGs, was something that Japan just hadn't seen before really, and they thought that Star Trek would be the perfect vehicle for it. And that was why in 1983 they created Japan's first domestic pen and paper RPG, Enterprise Role Playing Game in Star Trek. The game came in a boxed set and included a rules booklet, three dice, 15 character cards that could be written on and erased, and a scenario module. As with the Michael Scott Star Trek RPGs, this was primarily a game of away missions and inter-crew activity. There were no rules for flying or fighting with starships in this game. This box set was the only release by Sakuda for the game. But as change is the essential process of all existence, Star Trek role-playing would once again undergo a change of its own. As the Star Trek brand had continued to grow with new TV shows and movie sequels, the way that Paramount were licensing characters and concepts became stricter and more complex. But a new studio was willing to enter the fray. Enter Task Force Games. Since 1979, TFG had been developing and releasing board games and pocket-sized micro-games that came in Ziploc bags. One of these was a ship-to-ship -ship combat game set in the Star Trek universe that saw players controlling one ship or a fleet in tactical engagements, gathering resources and information from across a hex map. The license that TFG held for Star Trek ruled out their use of certain aspects of the franchise IP, including the name, which, you know, kind of seems illogical, but it meant that they couldn't actually call it a Star Trek game, and instead they had to go with Starfleet Battles. They were also not allowed to directly reference the characters or events of the original series. They literally couldn't mention Spock or Kirk or detail any of the things that happened in the show. So drawing on the concepts, backgrounds and aliens from the original series and some of the animated series, the designer of the game, Task Force Games founder Stephen V. Cole, created a new Star Trek universe. This Starfleet universe has continued to grow and evolve since its inception in 1979, in much the same way that the Star Trek universe proper has evolved. They just took wildly divergent evolutionary paths. As well as the war game, Task Force Games released several other products set in the Starfleet universe, including a video game called Starfleet Command. And of course, there was an RPG. Prime Directive was developed in-house at Task Force Games and used a similar D6 system to that seen in the FASA Shadowrun and West End Games Star Wars RPGs of the time. As it was set in the Starfleet universe, the game avoided specific use of Star Trek characters and names and leaned more heavily into the space military aspect of Starfleet, with players taking on the role of a Federation Prime team, a unit of, and I quote, true thrill seekers of the Federation poised to deal with any emergency. There were a few supplements released for the first edition, a Federation source book, a GM screen, an adventure called Graduation Exercise, and an adventure module called Uprising. In a story that's become incredibly familiar by this point, Task Force Games were struggling financially. They split their development and publishing arms into two separate businesses, but unfortunately that wasn't enough to save them, and by 2002, Task Force Games was out of business. The original founder, Stephen Cole, created a new company, Armadillo Design Bureau Inc., and they took over some of the licenses and some of the projects that Task Force Games had been working on. Armadillo took over the Starfleet Battles game and produced a new version of Prime Directive, using Steve Jackson Games' GURPS system. 
Alongside the core book, there were source books covering the Federation, the Klingons, and the Romulans. In 2005, a second edition of GURPS Prime Directive was released to bring the game in line with the recently released fourth edition of GURPS. In time, there would be further versions of Prime Directive released as well. In 2005, Armadillo Design Bureau released a version under the D20 ruleset from Wizards of the Coast, and then in 2008, they released a version specific to the D20 Modern system. Only the Klingon sourcebook would get ported over to D20 though. As part of Free RPG Day, Armadillo published the adventure The Temple on Terralit Prime in 2007, and then The Dread Pirate Aldo in 2010, both of which were generic, so that they could be used by either the GURPS or the D20 versions of the Prime Directive game. In yet another example of unusual license management from Paramount, it would appear that Armadillo Design Bureau have a perpetual license to continue producing Starfleet Universe material. If you go to their website, you can see that they still sell Starfleet Battles and Prime Directive, and they've expressed no concern about being able to continue working on those titles, which I think is great. But if I was living in the 90s and I wanted to play an official Star Trek game, what would I do? Well, in 1998, the fledgling RPG company Last Unicorn Games would take on that web of licenses so that they could release a new Star Trek game. Originally formed four years earlier by college roommates Christian Moore and Owen Saylor, Last Unicorn had been doing well with their first RPG, Aria, Canticle of the Monomyth. Though not without its issues, the game had done well enough that designer Moore was looking to new properties. Moore, Sailor, and new employee at Last Unicorn, Rob Isaacs, developed the initial game mechanics for a new rule set, the Icon System, whilst the company secured the rights to Star Trek. Those rights agreements were structured in such a way that Last Unicorn could release games set in Star Trek, but for some reason, they would go on to create distinct products according to the show the games were based on. So, in 1998, the world was introduced to Star Trek The Next Generation role-playing game. Last Unicorn's TNG game would receive solid support over the next couple of years. A narrator's toolkit, which included a GM screen and a player's guide, were both released, followed by some key sourcebooks. The Price of Freedom, the United Federation of Planets sourcebook, as well as including this eye-warping page, provided details on the structures, history and operations of the Federation and Starfleet. Books on Starfleet intelligence and Federation planets rounded out the background on Starfleet, whilst a volume of scenarios set in Federation space provided missions for your campaign. A background book on the Vulcans, called The Way of Colinar, was joined by a box set on the Romulan Star Empire, The Way of Dera. Another box set was also produced based on Starfleet Academy. Only one campaign book was released for the TNG game, a fragile piece, The Neutral Zone, which featured four adventures referred to as episodes that are connected by virtue of taking place within that dangerous neutral zone. Another scenario book was also released, one that I find super interesting, Holodeck Adventures. This book included new rules for using holodecks in your game, including all of the lore behind them, the history, not the android, and advice on how to get the most out of them in your game. It also had three complete adventures based on classic hollow novels, like The Doom That Came to Korath, a gothic tale from Alpha Centauri that bears a supernatural similarity to H.P. Lovecraft's Doom That Came to Sarnath. These look like super fun adventures to me, and I think there's something really interesting about those multi-levels of storytelling. We would be a group of friends playing a game set in this fictional world of Star Trek, where our characters would be playing another game on the holodeck. And I think that there's this kind of meta opportunity, I suppose, to tell something really, really interesting in your story. How does your character actually play another character? I don't know. There's just something in there that I think, yes, it could get very navel-gazy and self-indulgent, but it could also be just really fascinating and quite an interesting experience. And the holodeck is one of the coolest bits of tech from Star Trek, so I would love to play around with that and do something quite interesting, I think. And with all of that great material that Last Unicorn Games have now released for Star Trek The Next Generation role-playing game, where do they go next? Well, in 1999, they produced Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the role-playing game. The DS9 RPG was far shorter lived than its TNG stablemate, receiving only one core book and a couple of supplements. The line was headed up by veteran RPG designer Stephen S. Long, who had joined Last Unicorn to help develop the TNG game ahead of its launch at Gen Con. 
Alongside the core book, DS9 received a dedicated narrator's toolkit which detailed lots of new information about Bajor, Cardassia, Ferenginar and their respective peoples. A source book, Raiders, Renegades and Rogues was also released, which focused on the life of an outlaw in the Star Trek setting. Also released in 1999 was the Star Trek The Original Series role-playing game. This game also received a narrator's toolkit of its own, full of era-specific information and advice on how to build adventures and campaigns that reflected the original Star Trek show. A source book all about Andorians was released as well, and apparently this went on to inspire, or at least inform, a lot of the Andorian culture that was seen in the Enterprise TV show a couple of years later. As with all of the Star Trek titles released by Last Unicorn, these books were built using the Icon rule systems, which meant that even though they were technically different games, they were largely compatible anyway, which kind of makes you wonder why they federated the releases in the first place. But there was something else that Last Unicorn did across its entire line that was innovative and interesting. They created a series of web enhancements. These books were released at a time when the internet was only just becoming mainstream, and whilst there would be plenty of other attempts at using the web to improve RPG offerings, I think Last Unicorn were really ahead of their time. Throughout their books, you could find a small icon next to certain bits of text, and wherever you saw it, it meant that there was a bit of relevant downloadable content available on the Last Unicorn website. And these weren't just stingy paragraphs of text, these were proper bonuses. Take that Holodeck Adventures supplement for instance. The DLC was a complete extra holo novel. These DLC enhancements are actually still available via the memory icon site, I will drop a link in the description below. A final expansion provided a view into the mechanics of time travel, All Our Yesterdays, the time travel sourcebook. This was to be the first expanded universe sourcebook compatible across all of the Star Trek lines, though no other sourcebook of this kind would actually end up being released. The book included details on the Temporal Directive and the Department of Temporal Investigations, as well as plenty of new rules and adventure seeds, and nine parallel histories accessible by Subspace Rift or Romulan Treachery. A collection of Starfleet crew miniatures were also released by Last Unicorn. A box of seven lead minis at 25mm scale. This was a Federation away team set. The box included a generic science officer, security chief, science specialist, medical technician and two security personnel, as well as Lieutenant Worf. Kind of an interesting selection, I think. Despite picking up an Origins Award for Best New Role Playing Game, Last Unicorn Games and their Star Trek RPGs were not long for this world. In the year 2000, Wizards of the Coast acquired Last Unicorn, as they expanded as a result of their own acquisition by Hasbro in the previous year. But in a quixotic twist worthy of Q, Wizards of the Coast would not get to publish the next Star Trek RPG. But before we get to that, let's just take a look at the unpublished material that Last Unicorn Games was working on. Now, this list is very long, so I'm going to read some of it out. They were working on source books about the Star Trek films, Klingons, the Bajorans, Cardassians, Orions, the Dominion, a neutral zone campaign, the Borg, and even the Mirror Universe. And all of that was leading up to a new core book for Star Trek Voyager, the role playing game. Now, all of this material was developed to some degree. There were complete chapters and complete manuscripts. And there were a couple of designers from Last Unicorn, S. John Ross and Steve Kenson, who actually published a load of that material online even after Last Unicorn went under. And the original DS9 RPG line runner, designer Stephen S. Long, actually kept working on a load of new material even after Last Unicorn was gone and the icon system was over. He actually published as many as seven books dedicated to the game on his blog for free. From 1994, the games company Decipher Inc, until then famous for their How to Host a Murder Party games, produced a Star Trek CCG. Decipher had pivoted into CCGs after the massive success of Magic the Gathering created an entirely new market, and they would see considerable success through the stars Trek and Wars, as well as later games based on Lord of the Rings. Because of those separate licenses from Paramount, Decipher were initially limited to just producing Star Trek The Next Generation cards, but the huge success of the game 
led to Decipher renegotiating their three-year deal in favour of a longer licence that included the original series, DS9 and the Star Trek films. But damn it, we're here for RPGs, not old country CCGs. Well, in 2002, Decipher released their Star Trek role-playing game. Decipher had managed to secure the Star Trek RPG rights when Last Unicorn Games was subsumed by Wizards, and to produce their new game, Decipher actually brought over the seven-person RPG development team from Last Unicorn, creating a brand new RPG and miniatures division within the company. This was quite a strategic play from Decipher, a worthy combo of cards, as Wizards managed to secure an ailing RPG publisher, but not one of its most noteworthy licenses or its development team. In fact, heading up the team of ex-Last Unicorn designers at Decipher was Christian Moore, the erstwhile founder and president of Last Unicorn Games. The new Star Trek RPG had the benefit of covering the entire Star Trek license at the same time, and the rule system would be something new, the Coda system, designed to work with D6 dice, but which shared some similarities with Wizards of the Coast's D20 system. The game was reasonably well supported, with a player's guide and narrator's guide made available alongside source books dealing with Starfleet operations, starships, aliens, creatures, and worlds. These were broad supplements that provided an extensive range of detail about using the people and places of the Star Trek universe in your game, which could be set in any time period from Kirk to Janeway. Decipher also published Through a Glass Darkly, a guide to the Mirror Universe, though this and the World's Book were only going to be released as digital PDFs. By the year 2005, Decipher entered what we now know to be the standard part of the cycle for any publisher of Star Trek RPGs. They were in financial difficulty. They had had a series of misfires and poor performing products. They had lost the Star Wars license a couple of years earlier, and essentially they decided to cut their losses and just end their RPG division, completely stopping all production on any Star Trek role playing. It would be a couple of years before the CCG was cancelled, but as they say, all good things. It would be more than a decade before players could set foot on a canonically Star Trek Starfleet bridge again. Modifius is a London-based games publisher originally founded in 2012 by husband and wife team Rita and Chris Birch. The Birches launched their first RPG, Acton Cthulhu, a game of Lovecraftian action set during the Second World War, via Kickstarter the following year. The game debuted Modifius's new 2D20 rule system, and it sold tremendously well. Modifius subsequently expanded and went on to produce a broad range of licensed RPGs, board games, miniatures, and card games, based on a host of popular IPs. Those licenses have since included Dune, Conan, Kung Fu Panda, and of course, Star Trek. Modifius acquired the Star Trek license in 2016, announcing that they were working on a whole new RPG to be supported by miniatures, which would be called Star Trek Adventures. It would be another year before the game was actually released, but since then, the line has been going strong. The core book places the game's default setting somewhere around late Star Trek Next Generation and early Deep Space Nine. Voyager is lost, the Dominion are becoming a better understood threat to the Federation, and there are innumerable story possibilities for your campaign. The Modifius books look gorgeous, and though they are not the first RPG to use Elkars as the starting point for their design, they do so with magnificent artistry. They are published on black glossy ink paper though, which means that you can get fingerprints all over them. It's a constant threat to the Federation. Which, come to think of it, I imagine L cars on starships would be really fingerprinty and very gross. The Modifius Star Trek game is the one that I have played the most, by far so I can't really comment on its quality relative to its predecessors. But I will say that it's an incredibly fun game, and the 2D20 rule system does a terrific job of creating that collaborative, problem-solving feel that you get from the best episodes of Trek. This game also vies with the FASA version for receiving the broadest and most diverse range of support. If you want to explore any quadrant in more detail, you can, with each receiving a dedicated source book. Similarly, the Command, Operations, and Science divisions have each received books that expand options for characters who take on these roles. There have been a load of one-off adventures released via PDF, and two scenario books, each featuring at least eight new missions. These are the Voyages and Strange New Worlds. Modifius have also released PDFs of various NPC packs, including the Cruise of the Enterprise D, Deep Space Nine, and Voyager. 
They even released a range of miniatures to support play. Starfleet crews from the original series and Next Generation, generic Federation officers, Klingons, Borg and Romulans, and most excitingly, iconic villains from Star Trek history. General Chang looks suitably awesome. Klingon and Starfleet shipboard tiles were also produced so that you'd have an appropriate playing surface for these minis to stand on. At one point, there was a plan to release Romulan and Borg tiles too, but these got cut after poor sales, unfortunately. As well as the recent Utopia Planitia sourcebook, there have also been two new versions of the game that take the same rules but retheme things a little for different flavours of campaign. First up, the Tricorder set is totally committed to helping players play games set in the original series era of Star Trek. Even the box is shaped like a massive medical tricorder. And secondly, a Klingon version of the core book was released. Now, it's not quite as hardcore as being entirely written in Klingon, but it has been completely rewritten to be from the perspective of the Klingon Empire rather than the Federation. And that's because you don't play Starfleet crews in this campaign, you play Klingons. Modifius have since announced that they're expanding their license with Paramount to now include some of the more recent shows. So a new campaign book for the Discovery era, 2256 to 2258, was released last year, and it's likely that there'll be new material further exploring the settings of Discovery and the new Picard era as well. And all I have to say to that is Lower Decks splat book when? I've talked a lot about and praised quite a bit the Modifius Star Trek RPG here, but I'm not sponsored or anything like that, I just wanted to show a bit of love for a game that I think is really well supported, and I think Modifius do a pretty good job making sure that there's a diverse range of content. I actually got the big Borg cube that they released, which you might be able to see over my shoulder here. It's enormous, it came with loads of books, and it was also bundled with the PDFs, which I believe Modifius do whenever you buy a physical book. You can go online and get the PDF version for free, which I think is fantastic. But that, that bundle that came with the Borg box, I still get updates about that years later when they've added something or changed something to the PDFs. So I think that's just a great way of approaching games and I think Modifius are just doing some really good work. Star Trek remains one of the most interesting and optimistic sci-fi universes for me. It's as filled with awe and wonder as it is with danger. I truly hope that the best stories are not behind it. And actually with all of these role-playing games, those great stories are probably in front of us as players. I think all of these different lore and divergent versions of the Star Trek universe have proven one thing to me, and that's that even though it may not have the official Star Trek name on it, something can still feel like Star Trek. And even when it does have the official name, it might not feel like Star Trek at all. But it's entirely up to us what we want to play and how we want to play it. What's true canon, what's lies, it's all true, especially the lies. And we can play in whichever version of Star Trek that we want to. I think that it's magnificent that there have been so many great attempts at Star Trek. I mean, obviously, a couple of bad attempts as well. But with that infinite diversity and infinite combination of stories, there's so many opportunities for us to play. And I can't wait to play every single one of them. If you've enjoyed this journey through the history of Star Trek roleplaying, then I would really appreciate a comment or a like, or even a super thanks if that's something that you do. And if you want to join this Borg collective of hobby historians, then assimilate the subscribe button. That's probably enough references for now, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. just don't get it, do you? The game never ends. We wanted to see if you could expand your mind and your horizons. And for one brief moment you did. For that one fraction of a second, you were open to options you had never considered. And then you rolled a one.